The Bushmen, who live in the Kalahari Desert of Southwest Africa, have no possessions. And since there is nothing in the world that is not free and accessible to all of them, they desire no possessions. Living in a hot climate, they need few garments readily obtained from the skins of the occasional animals they kill for food, and nomadic in nature, they have no dwelling places, but at night simply sleep around the fire on the sand. How different from the world in which we live. Our lives are cluttered from attic to basement with things, hundreds upon hundreds of things, little things, big things, and sometimes it seems that we don't own the things in our lives, but rather they own us. Okay, besides the things we already have, and we don't really realize until we move from one place to another how many we do have and how unnecessary most of them are, what else do you want? Have you ever made out a want list? If you'll seriously set about it, you'll probably be surprised by how little you really want. You'll also realize that what you put on your want list is well within your reach over the coming years. You might want to try writing out a want list. Such a list has a way of bringing order into our lives. Of course, you can't list every little thing you'll want for the rest of your life. Those things come along as a part of living. But I mean the big important things. What do you want that you don't now have? Someone once said that the American people can have anything they want. The trouble is they don't know what they want. With such an abundance of everything, we're often like children standing in front of a mile-long candy counter or a person looking at a really good restaurant menu. How do you make a selection from such abundance? If you decide on one thing, you're passing up all those other things. As a result, many people choose impulsively. Often, too, by getting too many little things, they dissipate their means and thus they're unable to obtain larger, more important things. So it's wise to spend some time thinking about just exactly what we will want from the years ahead of us. Such a want list doesn't have to be limited to tangibles, by the way. List the intangibles, too. What will comfort and enrich us on snowy or rainy days? What will cause us to get up in the morning with interest and enthusiasm in our later years? And to what do we wish to commit ourselves for at least a part of our days that's big enough and interesting enough to keep us happily occupied for the rest of our lives? And certainly, we'll list those wonderful things we want to have just because they're wonderful to have and enjoy. They're fun. Our toys, you might say, or collector's items. A want list is not an easy thing to work out. It takes time and a lot of good, hard, deep thought. But try it. Go to work on your want list. You may want to do it very privately, sitting on a beach somewhere or on a park bench. But it is a very good idea. I had lunch with some friends the other day, and one of them told a rather interesting story. It seems there was a great flood. It was probably this last spring. One man with his house half full of water was offered a ride to higher ground by a passing boater. No thanks, he said. I have faith that the Lord will protect me. And as the water rose higher, he continued to pray to be saved. Soon he was on the roof, with the flood waters still rising. Another boater came along and offered to take him to safety. No thanks, he said. The Lord will save me. Before long, he was standing on the ridge of the roof, the water up to his neck, when a rescue helicopter hovered overhead and dropped him a rope with a rescue strap. Again he refused, and the helicopter pilot went on about his rescue mission. Soon the floodwaters swept the man from his perch, and he was drowned. In heaven he came into the presence of the Lord and told the Lord of his disappointment that he had not answered his desperate prayers. But I tried, said the Lord. I sent two boats and a helicopter. Well... We chuckled at the story, but it reminded us that we often don't see or appreciate help when we're surrounded by it. Have you ever heard someone, usually one very young, say, I don't need anybody, I'll go it alone. I seem to remember saying the same thing myself when I had more ambition than good sense. Even Robinson Crusoe, when he landed on his island, had a good store of knowledge accumulated from books and his contact with others, and it saved his life. As one expert put it, we think, and we often say, that a new idea or insight is the product of a single human brain. In one sense it is, but all our creativity today is not a product of an isolated human brain, but of one conditioned by interaction with other humans and by the history of civilization. What kind of progress could we make in the new thoughts and ideas with which we deal today if mankind had not left us the legacy of language, of numbers, of symbolic thinking in general? 
Ralph W. Gerard tells of a meeting in Berlin between a great English physiologist and a great German physiologist, both eventual Nobel Prize winners. The German, Otto H. Warburg, was working on the enzymes in cells that make it possible for them to use oxygen and give off carbon dioxide and so get the energy to support their activity. He almost had the respiratory enzyme, as it has come to be called, but he had not quite been able to pin it down chemically. The Englishman, Archibald V. Hill, mentioned an observation just reported at the Physiological Society in England that light can break up a combination of hemoglobin and carbon monoxide. This gave the clue. Warburg spent that night in the laboratory blocking the respiration of yeast in the presence of carbon monoxide and restoring it by strong illumination. The next morning, he sent off the paper that brought him a Nobel Prize. His insight and idea were clearly sparked by the communication from another mind. He made an important discovery and deserved his prize, but he probably could not have accomplished it by himself. The point is that you just can't go it alone, and that it's a good idea to develop a sense of the brotherhood of man. As John Donne so beautifully put it, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And if a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. We need and must depend upon each other to survive and prosper. And since this is true, it should engender in each of us a sense of gratitude to our fellows. It was a Saturday afternoon in the summer of 1927. The place was Scheib Park, Philadelphia. There were 35,000 excited baseball fans in the stands, all booing one man. Bob Lefty Grove, who was probably one of the greatest left-handed pitchers of all time, had just struck Babe Ruth out on three pitched balls for the second successive time and two runners were left stranded on base. As the great slugger returned to the bench amidst the wild and abusive jeering, he looked up into the stands with an unruffled smile, just as he had the first time he struck out, gave his cap a polite little tip, stepped down into the dugout, and calmly took his drink of water. In the eighth inning, his turn came up again. This time, the situation was critical. The Athletics were leading the Yankees 3-1. to one. The bases were loaded, and there were two out. It was up to the great Babe Ruth to win the game or lose it. As he selected his favorite bat and started toward the plate, the crowd rose in a body as if by signal. The excitement was tremendous. The crowd wanted Babe Ruth to strike out again. Lefty Grove rifled the first blazing fastball over the plate. Ruth swung and missed. The next pitch was good and Ruth swung so hard and missed that he staggered and fell down. There was a cloud of dust as the big guy sprawled on the ground, and the crowd was going mad. The babe got to his feet, brushed the dust off his trousers, and got set for the next pitch. Grove delivered the ball so fast, few of the fans even saw it. Babe swung again, but this time there was a crack like a rifle shot. The ball soared high and far. It cleared the scoreboard and the houses across the street. One of the longest hits ever made in baseball history. As Babe Ruth trotted around the bases and across the plate behind the other runners with what proved to be the winning runs, he received a wild ovation from the crowd, the same crowd that had been booing him all afternoon. Babe looked up into the stands, doffed his cap with that same little smile, and the expression on his face was exactly like the ones he wore on his first two trips when he'd taken the razzing. Later in the season, after the Yankees had clinched the pennant, an interviewer asked Ruth, Babe, what do you do when you get in a batting slump? And Babe answered, I just keep going up there and keep swinging at him. I know the old law of averages will hold good for me the same as it does for anybody else if I keep having my healthy swings. If I strike out two or three times in a game or fail to get a hit for a week, why should I worry? Let the pitchers worry. They're the guys who are going to suffer later on. Babe Ruth's unshakable faith in making the law of averages work for him enabled him to accept his bad breaks and failures with a smile. This simple, common-sense philosophy had much to do with making him baseball's greatest showman, biggest box office attraction, and the highest-paid ball player in his time. 
He had his faults, like the rest of us, but his faith in the law of averages made him great. There's a lesson there, I think, for all of us. Babe Ruth hit 714 home runs. He struck out 1,330 times. But we don't think about his failures, do we? And neither did he. He kept swinging and knew the law of averages would take care of the rest. How about you? In the message, Earl Nightingale presents a profound contrast between the minimalist lifestyle of the Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert and the cluttered, possession-driven existence many of us lead today. The Bushmen, living in harmony with their environment, highlight the beauty of simplicity and contentment with the basics. This serves as a stark reminder of how our lives are often consumed by material excess, which can weigh us down rather than enrich us. The suggestion to create a want list is a powerful exercise in self-awareness and intentional living. By doing so, we can strip away the unnecessary and focus on what truly matters to us. It's an invitation to declutter not just our physical spaces, but also our minds and priorities. In a world overflowing with choices and distractions, this practice can help us reclaim control over our lives and make more deliberate decisions. Nightingale's story about the man refusing help during a flood serves as a metaphor for our own lives. Often we are so fixated on receiving help in a specific form that we fail to recognize the assistance that is already available to us. It's a lesson in humility and openness, reminding us to be grateful for the help we receive, even if it comes in unexpected ways. This story also underscores the importance of community and interdependence. No one achieves success in isolation. We all rely on the knowledge, support, and collaboration of others. The example of scientific collaboration between Otto Warburg and Archibald Hill illustrates how breakthroughs often come from shared ideas and cooperative efforts. It's a testament to the fact that human progress is built on the foundation of collective knowledge and teamwork. This reinforces the idea that fostering a sense of community and mutual support is crucial for personal and societal advancement.